Welcome to Square Notes, the sacred music podcast. Your chance to learn about the teachings of the Catholic Church on sacred music, both in theory and practice, through interviews, discussions, and music. Your hearts and minds will be lifted up and better understand what it means to sing the praise of His glory. And now, your host, Dr. Jennifer Donaldson Novitska. Hello, listeners, and welcome to Square Notes, the Sacred Music Podcast, and the official podcast of the Catholic Institute of Sacred Music. Our guest today is the author of a book I have long loved reading and read with my students in the History and Principles of Sacred Music course at the CISM. Anna Maria Busberger teaches at UC Davis and is the author of Medieval Music and the Art of Memory. We discuss the role of memory in the life of the one who sings chant, the interaction between memory and notation, the role of the modes in memorization, and the implications of singing from a primarily memorized versus printed music reading method. If this topic is of interest to you, I recommend checking out our Introduction to Gregorian Chant course this summer at the Catholic Institute of Sacred Music, which I'll be teaching July 8th through the 12th, 2024. We, of course, discuss some of the things we discuss in our interview today, and the course serves as a thorough grounding in the fundamentals of singing Gregorian chant, with day one focused on notation and modes, day two on the rhythmic method of Dom André Macaro, and starting on Wednesday, we spend our time preparing scores, practicing conducting or choronomy, discussing methods of rehearsing and teaching the chant in parish choirs, and always grounding our work in prayer, singing lauds each morning together, and discussing the spiritual qualities of the Gregorian chant, as well as understanding how the various genres of chant serve as a spiritual guide through the cursus of the sacred liturgy. Our deadline to apply is fast approaching, May 1st. Find out more and apply at catholicinstituteofsacredmusic.org. And now, on to our interview. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's really a pleasure to have you on. I have loved your book for many, many years, and I use it in teaching in my, in my classes because I think it makes an important contribution to our understanding of um, the interaction between written and memorized inner worlds of music in the the process of making music that have a really profound impact on how church musicians think about their work, um, both as practitioners and even people who are teaching and handing on this tradition to other people. So could you summarize for our readers who might not know your book, Medieval Music and the Art of Memory, what is the central argument that you make in that book? So until recently, people thought that once an unambiguous notational system was invented, uh, musicians would stop memorizing and would just use this notation and sing from notation. Now, my argument is exactly, point of departure is exactly the opposite. That even though we have uh, by uh, about uh, 1025, when Guido of Arezzo invented the staff, we have an unambiguous notational system to notate pitch. And by the time of the Notre Dame period, we have an unambiguous system for uh, rhythmic notation. Nevertheless, uh, pieces were continued to be memorized. Notation just allowed for exact memorization. You could check, but you continued to memorize. So I think memorization... Uh, written and oral uh, uh, transmission continue to coexist. Uh, The central argument, at least until 1600, but maybe even longer. And so, of course, you know, the the practicing church musician today realizes that this is an important question to ask because they have the experience of working with a church choir, let's say, and the church choir sings the music which they have memorized better often than the music, which they are just responding to the music coming off the page. So could you, could you speak about, um, you know, perhaps the historical experience of that? Did, did people in the, at the beginning of the invention of notation and towards the end and tapering off towards a a primarily read uh, practice, think about these questions and how did they think about those questions? You know, it is such a, a fascinating topic uh, when I uh, was writing uh, my book, I uh, was interviewed 
by Anna Maria Freeman, who is uh, one of the singers from this fantastic uh, Norwegian ensemble trio medieval. They do medieval uh, music all over the world. They're world famous. And she told me that there are three women, that one of the women is unable to read music. Uh, and she's a wonderful singer. And uh, 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 so they were, of course, particularly interested in this topic. But I think there are many famous opera singers uh, uh, who cannot read notation. And they are great singers. They just get uh, coaches and they, they manage just fine. But I think uh, in the Middle Ages, it just it was just a normal that you memorized, even if you read uh, could read notation. Uh, I think the literacy was only for a select few. This is the the uh, interesting thing. To get to a slightly different uh, period uh, uh, in the 15th century, most important uh, singer of German songs uh, is a very famous poet, and he, we thought until recently musicians called Oswald von Wolkenstein, a wonderful poet. Uh, one of the great German poets. This guy, could he was a famous diplomat and he traveled around Europe with various kings, but he could not, uh, very likely could not read and write and certainly could not uh, compose polyphonic music. Nevertheless, he uh, was interested in, uh, he took tenors from polyphonic compositions, wrote a new text for them, and then had them transcribed by scribes uh, in, with a new text, and they were performed. So these were contrafacta, but he could not uh, read and write music. It's absolutely fascinating. And yet he wow. uh, supervised the collected edition of his output, which is uh, preserved in two uh, manuscripts. Wow. He couldn't read it himself. So we, we are completely off when we think that uh, music notation was central for the singers. And we're just talking about a, a huge skill set that, you know, so what, what if you had to make the outlines of what a skill set looks like for a musician who's able to do something like that versus someone who thinks that they're so much more advanced than that type of singer because they are primarily notation driven, what, what are they missing out on? Like what, what are some skills missing from that skill set if you are a primarily notation only person? You know, this, this I, I wouldn't dare to answer because there are, of course, wonderful musicians who are primarily notation driven. So I wouldn't dare to say that those, the, those who are not notation driven are, are better. I think it is just a different way of uh, approaching music. So I, uh, I, I I don't think we have had enough studies on this from psychologists, so I wouldn't dare to go into that territory. <laughs> <laughs> so could you maybe perhaps talk, though, about the skill set, the mental skill set of someone who is, you know, uh, let's say um, late uh, first millennium into the early parts of the second millennium musician, what are some of the things they do mentally to um, memorize massive amounts of anything? Yeah, uh, let me start with the education. How how you how you uh, you entered the monastery and you couldn't read or write, of course, uh, but you had to sing your offices several times a day, and you had to say uh, sing the mass and so on. You had to memorize enormous amount of music. I think uh, Kenneth Levy, who was a very distinguished uh, chance scholar in uh, Princeton, computed that it amounts to something like 70 to 80 uh, hours of memorized music. And it would include the entire output, the, all the operas of Wagner and the entire instrumental music of Beethoven. Can you imagine? So this is what these uh, uh, monks had to memorize. So how did you approach this? They, um, they would sing every week the 150 psalms. So those they would pretty quickly learn by ear. And at the same time, those who were more gifted and talented would also stir, learn how to read from the psalms. And uh, they didn't know Latin at first, but they would learn at the same time Latin and uh, literacy. This was the same thing. So you would first memorize nouns. Uh, and then you would uh, combine these nouns with verbs. Then you would uh, add adjectives. But this was all done in Latin. And gradually, 
they had a very good uh, knowledge of Latin, but it was all uh, mainly oral, but also you learn how to read at the same time. So that was the first step. And the repertoire, the graduates were transmitted in writing from about 800 on. So there were certainly many people in these monasteries who would read them, have access to them. The earliest music notation, and these are nooms. Nooms are highly ambiguous. You cannot uh, uh, read a piece transmitted in nooms unless it is also transmitted later in a, di uh, in a notational system with a, with a staff. So uh, these were the nooms were came uh, ninth century. Uh, so they were hundred years later. So all of the material which uh, was needed for the office and for the graduates was at first, was always memorized, absolutely. And the most basic uh, way of memorizing is, is division. So this is why we have, uh, for example, a Bible subdivided into verses and so on. Uh, if you have to memorize uh, 40 words, it's very difficult. But if you subdivide it into uh, 20 and then those further into five, uh, units, then it, be it becomes very easy. So that was the most common uh, method of memorization since antiquity. And of course, it was applied to all of the chant and all of the uh, Bible passages. But um, uh, in addition, uh, the church had a liturgical sequence. So the gradual, for example, and the antiphonous were uh, uh, always organized liturgically in liturgical sequence. So you would start with Advent, and then you would move on to Christmas and to New Year and go through the liturgical year. But uh, now uh, let me go back uh, to some uh, other memorization methods which were used to memorize uh, material also since antiquity. And that's something called a florilegium. And a florilegium is, um, contains enormous material but it is classified, it is put into various categories. So uh, one of the main usages for these florilegia were uh, friars who went all over uh, and needed to have sermons. So let's say they wanted to talk about sin. In order to be able to talk about sin, they needed uh, an assembly of all of the passages from the Bible which would deal with sin, which they would find uh, in this florilegium. So they would then be able to check under sin, and then they would have all these passages, and they had memorized these texts earlier. Because most of these people made their own florilegium. They assembled it. Uh, they would look for subjects which are of importance to them, and they would put all of the material which they had previously memorized into these categories so that if necessary they could retrieve it quickly really so the the process of making a floral florilegium yep. um you know and just the process of medieval scholarship in general was kind of a fruit of their time in the scriptorium with the books and then that memorization process meditating on it and then the production um of this book for the sake of preaching and rhetoric exactly yeah also for writing letters for writing books, you could use your florilegium for anything. But it is essentially a way of classifying, categorizing material, any material. I mean, you could make an arithmetic florilegium, you could make a, a grammar florilegium, uh, whatever you are interested in, and then you retrieve it very quickly. And it, it does seem to be like a, a, a method of scholarship that is sometimes lost in, in the, 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 the modern context where sometimes people are so intent on, on, on dealing with small bits of information that they never commit to memory. But the, the process of memorization seems to help cement bigger ideas, bigger concepts, the categories Absolutely. for a much deeper level of learning, um, both from the universal into the particular, right? Right, absolutely. Now, uh, it is very interesting because of my work. I have been observing. I've been in very. I've had so many fellowships and with various uh, outstanding uh, scholars, and I'm always observing them very carefully. And I have to say, uh, I always uh, uh, thought I had a very good memory. But 
historians in general, uh, people who do this kind of work have outstanding memories. So they, they naturally do this, what, what the people did in writing, they do it in their mind naturally. And whenever you come to a topic, things will flow out very quickly. I think people who are drawn to these, uh, to historical subjects are uh, prone to have very good memories on the whole. Yeah. So could we talk a little bit about the introduction of the modal system into chant and how this helped in terms of the categorization and memorization process? So this is exactly connected to the uh, to, uh, to the Florilegia. So in music, uh, uh, once I started to read about these Florilegia, it became immediately clear to me that uh, this same categorizing activity was applied to music in tonaries. So um, uh, you see tonaries, uh, no, before the tonaries were invented, uh, chant was always going liturgically, according to the liturgical year. And once these ternaries were invented, this was fundamentally reorganized according to modes. So I think this is why the modes were transferred from Byzantium in order to classify, in order to analyze the entire existence chants. And you, the important thing is that the, the, the singers could do these, the cantors could do this without uh, proper notation. I mean, just with the uh, nooms. Uh, so they had, must have had a very exact idea of how each melody uh, went. What was the final? What was the reciting tone and so on? And uh, as a result, they were able to classify these. Uh, at first, there were about 12, 1300 antiphones, but eventually there were three, 4,000. And they classified them for the first level always according to mode. Oh, could I clarify just in, in our discussion, what is a tonery? A tonery uh, presents the antiphones uh, in a newly, in a newly devised order. Uh, in the first, on the first level, it is always classified according to mode. But then there are subcategories about which I will be very happy to talk in a moment. Right. Yeah. So essentially it's a book and it has the entire chant or just the incipit? Uh, you know, uh, may, most of the toneries are with antiphones, but they're, at the beginning there were also uh, gradual. Uh, gradual uh, no, it's just the incipit. It's just the incipit. And the earliest antiphone which we have does not have new uh, nooms, but we were able to, uh, that's uh, 830, and it was copied in Germany. But it, we were able to reconstruct the melodies of these incipits, uh, uh, thanks to another tonary which does have nooms, and where, where we know how the melodies goes. So it lists all of these, uh, all of these, uh, 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 12 or 1300, uh, antiphones, and first all of them in mode one, then in mode two, mode three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So just to clarify now, there are several facts which a mode tells us, um, but you're kind of focusing on one of the facts, right? And that it, that would be in the organization of these, that it's really the final that makes the determination about whether an antiphon is in mode one versus uh, mode three or whatnot. Absolutely. They looked at the final, but it's not uh, when you go to the next level of subdivision after mode, because, you know, there's uh, 200 in mode one or something like that. So you have to subdivide mode one further. There, you also see that they don't only take the final into consideration, but also they have a thematic analysis in a way of the beginning. So you see the antiphones were always combined with a song. So you will sing the antiphone, you will sing a song, and you would return to the antiphone. When you go from the antiphone to the song, it's no problem because the antiphone will always end on the final, right? So you know uh, the song tone, you can match it with the final. But what is more problematic is when you have finished with the song, you need to return to the antiphone. You need a good transition. And there are many possibilities, and these are called variously by the theorists definitio, terminatio, uh, there are lots of, lots of possibilities how it's called. And this is the next level of organization, of subdivision. So you first 
subdivided according to mode, and then according to this transition from the psalm to the antiphon. And so you, for example, will uh, list all, first all of them which start on the final. That's very common. Then you list all of them which start with an ascending fifth. Or then you li list all of them which start with an ascending scale or something like that. So you needed to have a very exact idea of the modal pattern of this uh, particular mode. Right. So you've got first category, mode according to the final. Um, second category within that, that single final and single mode that you've got the opening pattern. And then what, what are some other ways that it's, it's subdivided? Then you can have, uh, uh, alphabetical. That's an old division, which Aristotle already used for cat classification and liturgical. Some have first liturgical and then alphabetical. Some just have liturgical. There are so many possibilities. But the uh, crux of the matter is that if you start, let's say, with 200 in mode one, uh, and then you might have um, 40 for definitio one, uh, for one definitio, then another 20 for alpha, uh, starting with the alphabet. So it's there you analyze the text, not the melody. And then another 10 for lit according to liturgy. It's very easy to find. Uh, a piece because the singer will then know, okay, today is first Christmas day. Let me check my tonery. I need uh, some, this antiphone. And uh, then they find it in right. no time. And it's, it's, it's so, sort of just serving as a reference book heading into the liturgy. Exactly. It's like a dictionary. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Subject dictionary. Yeah. Right. So could we talk a little bit about um, backing up to the education process a, a little bit? Um, the process of learning these modes. One of the um, lovely things in your book is that you talk about the Noyane um, formulae and these different melodies that were kind of like model stock melodies that were just handed on as, okay, we, we memorize this little kind of exercise in mode one, and then um, that helps our ear get accustomed to how to sing in mode one, and then we sing or the actual chant we're going to sing. Could you talk a little bit about that? You know, I think these, these, no, Anna, they were, by the way, the first theorists didn't understand what they meant. They, they had very funny remarks about it, but very quickly, uh, uh, they, they were understood. You know, they recalled the modal pattern. Uh, so you, you knew where the half steps and whole steps of each mode were. And, uh, after a few years, they were replaced by Latin. Uh, melodies, which were, uh, I think, in, uh, after a thousand, they would have uh, Latin melodies, which I also list in my book. Right. And those texts are just kind of lovely, like quotes from scripture, seek first the sing kingdom of God, the second is like unto it, etc. Exactly. So they were enormously helpful. You know, once you knew the formula or the Latin text, you knew how the mode works, uh, works and then you knew uh, it starts with a t uh, final or it starts a fifth above the final, you could reconstruct it very quickly in your mind. You didn't need notation. Right. That's a crucial thing because you had the modal pattern and you had these classifications so that that was a substitute. And could you talk a little bit about just where the title no way on it? <laughs> like, wh what does that come from? I, I, You know, I think this comes from Byzantium. Uh, I think they were used there. Um I don't. I don't know any more about it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Peter Jeffrey has written some interesting article which I cited in my book, so you might want to look there. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, and I mean, the modern musician can do this too. For example, let's say that they want to sing, you know, um, a, a, a mode one um, uh, gradual or something, or um, a mode one introit. They could sing something like a melody that they already know in mode one, like the Ave Maria. Or they're preparing to sing something in mode three. They sing through a verse of the Pange Lingua first. Absolutely. It is an excellent method for getting into this without notation. Yeah. You don't really need it. You just need to have memorized these formulas. Yeah. 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 Could you talk a little bit about, um, what do you think, you know, if you're thinking about this like a religious monk, um, what are some of the spiritual benefits that come from um, having a primarily aural and interior memorized approach to the singing rather than responding to what's on the page. It's not only singing, it's also the text. 
You know, I think uh, this is a very important uh, question you are raising there. You know, uh, I, uh, I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm much older than you. So I come from a, a tradition. I'm a Lutheran. I'm not a Catholic, but I had a, a pastor, Lutheran pastor, a wonderful guy who was in the uh, resistance group against Hitler. So he, uh, uh, he made us, when I had confirmation classes for two years, memorize enormous amount of uh, scripture passages and uh, Lutheran Qurans. Let me tell you, I, and he would constantly tell us because he had lots of friends who had been in concentration camps, how important it was to have such a memorial archive uh, for uh, troublesome situations. You know, when you are in need, you need to have Bible passages. You need to be able to sing to yourself certain hymns. And I, ha- I am so grateful to him. It is, for me, very important. Yeah, you know. That seems to be the the experience of priests, too, going in and giving last rites to people. One of the things that people remember on the deathbed is things they memorized when they were six and seven years old. And my father, who was a Lutheran pastor, you know, he had uh, always the right words. I remember when my uh, aunt was dying, I was with him, and he he helped her by, because he had it all uh, memorized, and it was it was very meaningful. So I think this is so important. And, of course, with singing, it is equally important. If you can sing uh, uh, to the text, will come back to the person who listens to it. Uh, it's very important. So I think, uh, uh, you know, France still uh, is a, uh, one of the few countries where you memorize, memorize, memorize. Our daughter went to a French school and she has fantastic uh, uh, memory uh, of uh, French poetry and so on. But Unfortunately, others don't do it enough anymore. Right. And this is especially true, I think, you know, um, in the church music practice. You know, I think there are many ways in which um, uh, organists coming out of conservatory or university programs are some of the most well-rounded musicians. But it's not true in terms of memory, usually, because the, the practice there is the pianists memorize, but the organists play from the score. And um, But, you know, there, there are important musical skills that come to the fore only when you're memorized. So what what might you say to a choral director in terms of conceptualizing, you know, building memory into their program? How might they do that and what are the benefits? Let me tell you, I think the best choir directors do that. Uh, we we uh, spent half a year in Berlin. We have an apartment there. So uh, there are two world-class choirs in Berlin, Rias Kamakor and Rundfunkor, and they sing by heart. Completely. I, uh, and there, th- this is one of the reasons they are so good. <laughs> There's no question. Yeah. So I think it, it's a huge advantage. You can really concentrate on, on making music, on the expression in a completely different way. Yeah. And certainly, you know, for the uh, parish music director who's thinking of the chant repertory, obviously the first place to go to there is not just the simple uh, seasonal Marian antiphons, but the, the Kyriale. That seems like the, the logical first locus for the memorization. And then there are the fruits of having the choir look at you while you're directing because they're not looking at their score. A huge difference. Yes, exactly. Yeah. No, I also, when I sang in choirs, we uh, often uh, memorized things and it was a completely different experience. No, I think in Europe it's quite common. By the way, organists in Europe still know how to play, uh, improvise and play by heart. It's uh, part of the music organ education system. Very important, yeah. Yes. So maybe it's not so common in America, but in, in Germany, it's totally normal. Yeah. Great. This has been super helpful just in terms of even conceptualizing, um, you know, the, the, the system of, of education and the progress of history and the interaction between these two, these two ways of approaching music. So thank you so much for being able to join me, uh, Anna Maria. It's my pleasure. I had a very good time, Jennifer. We hope you've enjoyed listening to Square Notes, the sacred music podcast with Dr. Jennifer donaldson Novitska. For more information about this episode, sacred music resources, or upcoming events, visit our website at sacredmusicpodcast.com. You can subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, or your favorite podcast app. If you enjoy our podcast, please write us a review on iTunes. This improves our iTunes ranking and helps others find out about the podcast. The music you heard at the beginning of this episode is Hec Dies by William Byrd, sung by the London Oratory Schola Cantorum Boys Choir, directed by Charles Cole, 
from the CD, Sacred Treasures of England. The music at the conclusion of this podcast is from the Prelude and Fugue in G Major, BWV 550 by Johann Sebastian Bach, performed by Jennifer Donaldson Novitska. We look forward to having you join us next time. And until then, may we sing the praise of His glory.